line. What, uh, what obscurities have we seen in the last few days? Anything you'd like to talk about, ask about? It's all good. When last we spoke, Joe, I think we, yesterday, you had some obscure problem with parallel ports. Did you figure that out? Um, any other any questions on on the introduction to lab two? I know you're still working on lab one, but lab two is coming up as of this weekend. You got to start on. So so uh, we need to talk more about how to parallelize the calculation because you can't. Do, uh, do the calculation of the drum fast enough on a unity processor, so you have to have multiple processors. We need to talk about the, uh, the audio codec, the abstraction of the audio codec by, by the QSYS modules, and then how to talk to the audio codec. So I thought I would start on that, but First of all, going through the through the the, the description of this again, there are some there are some uh, links for parallel processing on, on FPGAs, which are a little abstract, <coughs> and. I guess the, the way to sort of motivate your thinking, this is this is the kind of thinking you do while you're, you know, walking to college town or uh, trying to go to sleep. Uh, and um, um, so the question is, given that you need to make 1,600 nodes, 1,600 nodes, and you've got 174 multipliers, what are you going to do? How are you going to multiplex, multiplex the multipliers? How are you going to reuse the multipliers in such a way to that you can use about um, you can get about ten nodes per multiplier? Have you thought about that? At all? So one way is to instantiate a whole bunch of small CPUs. That means you have to write a small CPU. But it turns out that's not hard. It's like two pages of code. Um, not a very good CPU, but a small CPU. Uh, another way to think of this is sort of geometrically, you have to do a fairly big drum. What if you d divided the drum into some shape patches? So let's say that we did a, a, a patch of four nodes. Now this is four out of 1,600 nodes. We did a patch of four nodes, and we calculated the update for those four nodes sequentially. So we're going to calculate one, then two, then three, then four. Then we're going to, at the end of the time step, output the value of one, two, three, and four onto one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight wires which would then go to the next patch of four, which is being calculated sequentially by a processor. So you could think of this then as a state machine that, that steps through four nodes and uses the same multiplier, but it uses it sequentially to update the four nodes in the, in the patch. And then you would tile this whole thing by putting down copies of this connected by their edge wires. And of course, then on the, on the very edge of the drum, the last edge wire would just be wired to a zero. <coughs> so we say, how much memory does that take? Four nodes, there's two state variables per node. You 
UN and UN minus one. So we need eight words of memory. That's easy. Um, we need how many cycles to do this? Well, let's say if we wrote a, a sequential processor, then a truly sequential processor with an adder and a multiplier, then we need something like four times the number of cycles to do one arithmetic setup. And we know that there's, it's about 10 operations per, per update. It's about 10 operations. The, 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 the finite difference recursion uh, relationship that I drew up last time has about 10 arithmetic operations per node update. So we'd have to do maybe 40 operations, each one of which potentially has a couple of memory accesses. So that could be 100 operations, something like that. How many cycles do we have between audio samples? Well, if you're running at 100 megahertz state clock, you have uh, 100 cycles per, per, per microsecond, okay? And you have about, 20.8 microseconds. So you can easily, you easily have the time to do the calculation on a four by four. And you easily have the memory to do it. And you have enough multipliers, well, you don't have enough multipliers for a four by four patch. How big would the patch have to be so that you can do this with 174 multipliers? So that's one way of looking at it, is to not do a general purpose processor because you really don't need to do a, a branch conditional or an indirect load. All you need to be able to do is retrieve a value, add, multiply, and store. So all you need is a very small state machine to actually do the calculation. And you could write a state machine that steps through these and then just make a ton of copies of those state machines. Right, by the way, would be best be done using a generate statement, which we have to talk about also. So that's one approach to, to parallelizing, is to hook together patches. Can you think of any others? It's, good, it's a good thought thing to do, again, while you're eating dinner or, or you know, instead of staring at your phone while you walk to college down. So, um, but I'll get back to that on another what I want to do right now is to is to talk a little bit more about this uh, the audio interface because ultimately your output from this lab is going to go through the audio interface because you're making drum sounds. As you probably noticed, there's a green connector on the top of the board, and it's connected to a uh, Wolfson. audio codec chip. This is separate hardware from the FPGA. It is a peripheral that's driven through a few pins of the FPGA. Uh, it has some really nice features in it, which are summarized by this, by this uh, uh, block diagram. <coughs> One is it, <coughs> is that it has a uh, it has a low speed control interface, which is I2C. And you all go, oh, no, I2C. But that's been abstracted away. You never have to look at that. Then the high speed data is a serial format that is settable up to 32 bit format sound. It has line in from two line-in sources with volume controls on each one. It has a mic input, all of which can be mixed together and or muted and then summed up to produce an output. The typical way I use this is to run, is to turn off the mic, disable the mic, use our line-in to run the analog to digital converter and by the way, it has built-in anti-aliasing filters. Uh, to run the 
ADC, and then the ADC data is blasted out through the serial interface to the FPGA, where you can do signal processing. So it's a very high speed interface back to the, uh, I think, uh, 15 megahertz interface back to the, uh, to the uh, FPGA. Then the FPGA could send data through the DAC data to the digital filter and out the DAC. So you have a, you have a uh, FPGA in the middle between the analog to digital converter and the DAC. There may be times when you want to mix the, the unprocessed audio along with the processed audio, but typically you'd be running it into the FPGA back out. Mercifully, the process of doing all this serial to parallel conversion to get to and from the data format of the FPGA and all of the control interface has been hidden from you by a, by a QSYS module set. Do you have any questions about this? This is separate hardware. It has its own state machines. It has its own limitations. Which used to matter more when we were writing directly to it. But the data transfer hardware is is hidden behind the university audio core. Which has lots of interesting information in it. But the basic um, feature of it is that from the standpoint of your code, it is just on the Avalon bus. It is on the QSYS bus. It is an Avalon slave, and it has an exposed FIFO fill level, which you can read, and it has exposed a register, register for left data and right data. You check the FIFO space, if there's space in the FIFO, you write data to each channel. Then magic happens. It's serialized, and out it goes to the to the codec, to the Wolfson codec. So your interface is going to be check for FIFO space and write to it, or check for FIFO space and read from it because it also will do input to the ADC. But for this lab, it's going to be write only. You're going to write to this and output to the DAC. It's not quite write only because you have to read the FIFO space to make sure there's space in the buffer. Yes? Um, is it on the same clock to get to here? Because yes. But isn't the audio module uh, running on a slower clock because you're not out there on your sample of like Thank you. That was going to be the very next thing I said. Yes, you're not outputting. The, the Avalon Slave is running at 100 megahertz or so. However, space will only open in the FIFO when a value has been removed from the FIFO and output through the audio port. Therefore, by reading the FIFO, you've automatically, and not writing data until there's a space in the FIFO, you've automatically phase locked to the audio clock. So the FIFO won't come active, won't come empty for 20.8 <coughs> microseconds after you wrote the last one. And so you can't write again for 20.8 microseconds. So you check, 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 and when it goes true, then you do the calculation of the new sample, advance the drum one step, and output the value. So you never have to phase lock to the audio clock, nor do you need to read the audio clock. Rather, you just query the FIFO.
And there's a, a little bit of setup for this. It's a memory map. It's, uh, I, I, it's audio in, audio out. The default width was 32 bits. You can set it down to 16, or you could leave it at 32. You're going to do the calculation at 1.17, which means you have 18 bits. So if you're going to feed this into a 32-bit interface, you better left shift it by 22 bits, 18 plus 22, no, 12, 14 bits, I think that's right. You want to left shift it so that the side bit, the side bit is now in bit 31. So, then we have to ask, how do we control the bus lane? Well, there's two ways to do this. The only bus master that you have currently been messing with is the HPS. And you can use the HPS to control the audio bus slave, or you can write your own bus master in Verilog. For this lab, I'm giving you the design choice, which you want to do. Having an on-chip bus master is slightly cleaner logically. On the other hand, you have some experience already with the HPS bus master. You still, in the, on the HPS side, you still have to query the FIFO to find out when it's when there's an empty slot. Then you have to write both channels. So there's no less logic, but it's in C rather than Verilog, which some people prefer for some reason. The um, <clears throat> um, oh one oh, one thing I absolutely need to mention though is that the audio codec FIFOs are tricked up so that you must load both channels if you expect a sample to play. If you're going to do mono, if you're going to do a, a single drum sound, you have to load it into both channels or you get nothing out. That FIFO stalls. So, questions on this? So let's go talk about bus masters a little bit. We're going to start out on the, on the QSYS page for a moment because I originally put a description of a bus master here. This is a description of QSYS, so I think we've talked about it a little bit. But uh, the the main thing I want to talk about is the so-called Avalon Bus Master, and also known as the External Bus to Avalon Bridge, or EBAB. The, the EBAB is a uh, QSYS draggable block that abstracts the signal that the Avalon switch fabric requires into a slightly simpler set that you can then control from your variable. So you are going to generate a bus address with this because it's a bus master. You're going to generate a bus address, possibly data to write or data or you're going to read data from that address. You're going to give a read command or a write command, but not both. You have to tell the, the EB, AB how wide the word is. I typically lock this at 32 bits, but your, your mileage may vary. And the entire feedback from the bus has been abstracted into an acknowledge bit. 
So when you've asked to write something, you put data and address on the EBAB, then your state machine has to wait until the acknowledge comes back because you cannot guarantee how many cycles it will take for the bus to return. It could be anything from one to indefinite. So you do a command, you ask for something, either a write or a read, using the read write signals, and then you wait for the acknowledge. So the minimum state machine for the bus master will always have two states. One to read or write, and the other to wait until it's done. <clears throat> and the, it's kind of a twisted set of logic here, as is always the case with QSYS, but you're gonna write, you're gonna, you're gonna hook a bus master to some, it's gonna become a bus master. It's got its own lane. It's got its own master lane. Now it's not hooked to something. It is the source of a, of a, a separate lane. When you generate the QSYS, it is gonna generate an interface that looks like this with address, byte, enable, read, write, write data at, and read data lines. You're going to then connect this to your outside logic, which controls the bus master. So your outside logic then, the module that you write, will, will generate these signals and control the bus, including if you have a strong desire to reset the system often, you can write directly to HPS memory space. It's just a bus layer. Don't do that unless you're pretty familiar with Linux. But it's a general bus master. So the whole QSYS layout looks like this. Looks like this, where you have a, a bus master. In this case, it happens to be a video bus master, but that's okay. And it has a separate lane, which goes up here and is connected where? Where? It is connected to on-chip SRAM. And you notice that on-chip SRAM is also connected to the heavyweight bus. So both the HPS and the your own bus master can both write to the same bus port. What happens if you write audio data from both the HPS and your own bus master at the same time? It turns out you get interleaved samples. Because of the, if the bus priorities are equal, they, you go round robin between the various masters, you get interleaved samples, which is completely confusing. Don't do that. However, what you can do is you can load one FIFO from the HPS and the other FIFO from your own bus master and do stereo from two completely different sources, which could be interesting under some circumstances. Question. You said that you could uh, write the Linux address space uh, from this bus master. Mm -hmm. Does that require you to hook up its lane to some QSYS module that represents that? So there is a, which you, you probably haven't noticed because we haven't really talked about it, but uh, on, the, on the arm, there is an Axi slave. Aha. Uh Aha. -huh. Uh -huh. Turns out by default it's grayed out here because a lot of people never use that. But if you double click the ARM config box, which has lots of config options, one thing you can do, do is turn on the Axie slate, and that then you can write to. I have code that does that to a piece of memory 
that I can't decide whether it's safe or not. <laughs> I see people going, really? and that's right. And you should you should think carefully about this. Um, maybe somebody who knows more about ARM than I do can answer this for me. There's 64 of k, k of memory at address 0x f f f f 0 0 0 0 through f f f f. 64k bytes in high memory. As far as I can tell from the ARM documentation, that is boot RAM. What could possibly go wrong? So it does not appear to be used once the system is booted. It is not empty. It's been initialized. I looked at the contents of it. But I tried writing to it, and nothing seems to break. But I cannot justify to myself that this is safe. It seems to work. Does anybody have any, if you have any knowledge about that, come talk. Ah, the dreaded unable to update. You still can't update. Um, but I wrote, a, I wrote a DMA controller that barfs data directly into that 64K buffer at, at 250 megabytes a second. Slightly scary. Any questions? Okay, so now let's get down to the actual content of this lab, now that we've done the background, which is on the DSP page. No, wrong. It is on the bus master page. Bus master page, the last example on the bus master page is an audio output bus master. Exactly what I want you to write. And the QSIS layout in this case is, is quite simple. If anything could be called simple in QSIS, that is. There's the ARM, of course, as always. An audio video config. The AV config is what actually generates the I2C signals to set up the codec. Then there's the audio subsystem, which does all that serialization, deserialization, and manages the FIFOs and so on and so on. Then the only other module on here is the bus master I wrote. The Avalon master goes directly to the audio slave, as does the lightweight bus from the HPS. So either one of them can write to the audio interface. One thing to note is that the is that the audio subsystem is at, at address 3040 on the lightweight bus. So we need to know that for the, for the next step, which is now, what does this bus controller look like? What does the actual EBAB controller look like? We've got the usual IO pin declarations for the, for the FPGA itself. <clears throat> the HPS pins, and then the state machine for the for the, for the bus controller, for the bus master. And so I'm just hard coding in some bus, some bus addresses. We know the base address, we just looked at on QSYS, the base address for the audio is 3040X. Turns out that if you closely read the, the audio interface manual, you will find that the Avalon address for the FIFO fill is at four bytes above that. 
the left address, left uh, address, uh, right FIFO is at uh, eight bytes above and, and the right is at 12. <clears throat> so these are then the hard-coded addresses that we're going to need to read and write from for our bus master to control audio. And there are some details. I guess we ought to go look at the more at the audio interface here. Let's go down and look at the register map. Ah, the register map. Yes. So the first the first word at offset zero is some sort of control word, which is mostly about setting up interrupts, which we're not going to do. We're going to pull. Since we're pulling a bus rate, it's fast enough. Then there's a the FIFO space at offset four, which has four different FIFO levels in them. The right depth for the left channel and the right channel, and then the read depth for the left channel and the right channel. We're not going to read, so we're going to ignore these. Since the system always plays both channels at once, I'm not quite entirely sure why there's a depth for each one of them, but okay. So what we're going to do then is just read the top order byte of the FIFO space in the code. Then we're going to read right, we're going to write, write to these two registers to blast left data and right data out to the so we're going to ignore this, this, we're going to read the upper byte of this, and then output these two. Yes? Okay, I think the reason why it uh, has space for each of them is because if you write back and forward, you could only read from one or only write to one and be synced up. You could, but then it, if you don't fix that, then you will hang the... Well, no, you're right because, right, you're right because you can only read and write one at a time, and so you have to keep track of each one of them separately. No, you're right. <clears throat> so, what I actually wrote out here, what I actually am, 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 am blasting out of the of the I/O port, of the, of the audio port, is a uh, direct digital synthesis sine wave. <clears throat> and what we're going to do is set it up so. A new DDS sample is only calculated when there's a spot in the FIFO for it, because that guarantees phase lock. Your solver, the whole drum state machine, would go into that state. I also, for debugging, because this one is moderately annoying to get running, mapped bus write, bus read, and bus act to three GPIO pins so I could just scope them. Now, I didn't have to I didn't have to recompile every time to figure out what those three were doing, nor did I have to use logic uh, a logic analyzer just look at it with the scope. And with three or four bits that works very well. If you're gonna do any more than three or four you'd probably put them on switches so that you could switch back and forth between them interactively. So we start out, I was writing this on clock 50, you're probably going to run it on clock 100. Uh, we set the state machine because why not? You have to set the, you have to set the state to something. <clears throat> so I'm, 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 I'm getting rid of any pending bus requests here by setting these two to zero. And the timer is merely a debug device that I included in the state machine so that if the system wasn't in reset, the timer gets incremented by one and I could tell what was happening. I could, it gave me a time base in case I was using a logic analyzer. Then we set our state machine up to go to state zero. The bus address is set to the audio FIFO address. 
Plus Reed is set to one. Best Buy Dave is set to all four bytes. And then we go to state one, which is to wait for the read act. So, so state one, this state waits until the state variable is one and the bus act is one. Otherwise it just spins through the state machine waiting for both these conditions to be true. When the bus act is one and we're in this state, then we, of course, go to the next state, but we also do a bus read data. We take the bus read data signal and copy it into a variable called FIFO space. But we also shift it 24 bits because we want the high order byte. And then we're going to end the read so we go back to uh, bus read zero. Then we find out if there was actually room in the FIFO. If state is two and the FIFO space is greater than two, greater than two, why did I choose two? Why not one? Why not zero? Well, I wasn't sure whether I was off by one or not. So I so two was safe. Since there's 100, 128 FIFO slots for both the transmit and the receive. If we happen to wait an extra few microseconds or a fraction of a microsecond before we actually do the next write, it doesn't matter because there's enough samples in the FIFO to bridge over and you won't get any in interruption of the sound. So I, so I chose two there for no really good reason. We then do the direct digital synthesis operation, which is to, which is to do an accumulator uh, addition with some switches. This was so I could set the frequency from the switches, again, for debugging. We set the bus write data to sign out, shifted by 16. Sign out is a table, 16-bit table. Shifting it by 16 now makes it 32-bit data, which is what's required by the, by, the, by the codec. And then we do a bus write. Otherwise, if there's no space in the FIFO, we just jump back to state zero and try it. So if we get here, then we know that there's a slot in the FIFO that's open. We, we bus write the, the the data out. We set the audit. Oh, we do the other. Did, did I brain skip something here? Hmm. So you uh, do the original write and do the very original the, the Oh new, yeah. Okay. Uh, and then the they go and then possibly go back to zero. Now we're doing the the right channel. We did the left channel, but now we're doing the right channel. And again, shifting the site out, we're just putting the same data in both channels, uh, making the bus address the right audio address, making bus right one, waiting a cycle, check to make sure the bus act is, is one, and if it is, take the bus right to zero and take the state back to zero and, and try again. So that's the entire write state machine for the for the audio codec bus slave. And really what you would do then is to instead of having a direct digital synthesis unit here, you would put your whole solver in that state. Yes. I think this is broken actually. I don't think it's broken. Uh, it it worked. No, no, well, well, I think it's broken is I think you're not putting the same sample in the left and right channels because, uh, Ooh, now. Because you're doing the accumulation in the state machine at the same time you put a sample in the channel, and then you put a sample in the other channel after you've done the accumulation. So the one question is, when does sign out get calculated? The sign out is actually delayed a sample also. 
uh, because it's a it's in sync ramp. Yes, you are, you're right. They could be off by a sample. So, the state machine is fairly simple. You embed your solver directly into the state machine. And the synchronization with the audio, setting the, the, setting the solve rate of your, of your system is set by when the FIFO get, comes empty with a with an empty slot. <clears throat> so what does the C code look like that does the equivalent? So the second example here loads the left channel from one from from the from what from either the from the FPGA and the right channel from the HPS. So the S HPS program then looks like the usual uh, mapping. Oh yes, this is threaded and it's reading uh, the audio from uh, UDP connection from MATLAB. So there's a thread here which is reading uh, a, uh, um, a TCP IP port from MATLAB which is generating a music stream. MATLAB is astonishingly bad at sending UDP. It can do about 2,000 packets a second only. <clears throat> so this thread is just waiting for the socket, doing all the socket stuff. I'm not going to talk about this. This is the thread that writes to the audio FIFO. And what we're going to do then is to, of course, we have to do a mutex lock from the from the uh, from the shared buffer with the uh, with the uh, uh, UDP. We're going to then get some samples from the, the shared buffer. Wow, I should use a simple example. So where do we actually look at the yeah, here it is. So if there's for timing reasons, I had to do six samples at a time because the UDP was so slow. So we're decoding six samples, waiting until the, there's six slots available, and then barfing out six uh, samples into the audio left channel data pointer and left channel and right channel data pointer. Just the right channel data pointer. So the we're, here we're reading the audio data FIFO pointer as in the Verilog state machine, here we're writing to the two addresses as in the Verilog state machine. And I don't care which one you use. You can use either the C version or the, or the Verilog version. However, for lab three, you will have to use a custom bus master because reading back and forth across the bus won't be fast enough to do the graphics. So in this in this lab you have a choice, write C code and do a bunch of bus operations, or write Verilog with a slightly simpler interface maybe. And then but in lab three you'll have to write your own custom bus master for the video. In that case, then you'll be writing pixels directly into display memory. So your bus master will be solving a fractal and writing pixels directly into display memory. Any questions?
questions. So off the top of your head, how many people are going to use Verilog? How many people are going to use the HPS? HPS. Let's see. Yeah. Verilog. Yeah, really? Cool. Okay. I think it's cleaner. I think it's a little more interesting. But uh, I, again, it's a design decision you can make. I mean, given the uh, horrendous looking examples here, I don't think any one of us is convinced that uh, these are easier. Remember, this also does UDP. Let's see if I have a simpler HPS example. I don't think I bothered with it because I didn't see any reason to. If I can find one, I'll, I'll link it up on, on Piazza. There's one around, but I don't know where it is. It might be in the DSP. Although the, most of the stuff on the DSP page, I was going for speed and using the uh, using a bus master directly also. Oh no, that's right. These, oh yeah, yes. Uh, there's a drum here. Yes. So, this is an example which outputs a drum, which is what you have to do. Right, that's right. So here's we're setting up all of the, the the data pointers for the different pieces of the uh, audio codec, and then we drop into a loop while we wait for the audio FIFO. Data pointer to be greater than one, and uh, by this time I think I'd gotten rid of my obsession about off by one. And update the drum. This is the algorithm for doing the update in C, but only for the linear case. The nonlinear case, which you have to code in C, is left to the uh, as an exercise for the student. Mem copy to uh, do fast updates of the two arrays. Then we do a, a audio, uh, we, we write to the audio left channel and right channel as before. So this is slightly simpler because all it is is check the FIFO, update the audio source, in this case the drum, and then output it to the two audio channels. Now, if you do the calculation, you will have to do the calculation on the FPGA because the HPS is not fast enough to calculate the drum, it's not specified. So what you will do is, you will ask if there is a a slot open in the FIFO, and if there is, you will trigger the solver on the FIFO to do one sample, then read the sample back across the bus, and then emit it back into the, the FPGA through the left and right data. So there won't be a, a solver embedded in here because it's not fast enough. It, this will be just a, once there's a spot on the FIFO, you will, <coughs> you will initiate a solution, wait for the, FIFO, for the FPGA to finish, and then write the solution to the left and right channel. What happens if it doesn't finish in time? spells out and stuff sounding right. That's right. It's broken. In other words, your, your solution is not fast enough. So if you miss the deadline, the audio deadline, your system is broken. So again, you have to make this, the parallel solver fast enough that in 28.8 microseconds, plus the overhead of reading to and writing from the HPS, 
it is less than 20.8 microseconds. How long does it take to read to the HPS and back out again? Uh, bus transaction, you, do, you can do about 7 million transactions a second. So it takes a seventh of a microsecond. It's not a hugely long time. So two, two transactions to read the data back, reformat it, send it back out again, is going to be uh, um, two sevenths, which is 0.286 microseconds. So, um, now what do you think? C or C or Verilla? Verilla? How many hands? Hands. Verilla? Still Verilla. Okay. All right. Either way has its challenges. In this one, there's mu more bus traffic moving back and forth. In the other one, there's more state machine. But most of the state machine is going to be your solver. Most of the logic here will be your solver, not the interface to the EDA. I'll be in lab most of the afternoon. I have a meeting at 2 and another one at 3.30. I don't know how long it'll take, probably a half an hour, 45 minutes. It's writing seminar week. We're going to